Now, as I can't see any of you, sadly I can't guess how old any of you are. I can just hope that maybe some of you might be old enough to have frequented the alternative comedy circuit back in the late 80s. And you may even have come across a double act called Pep Talk. That was me. Well, I was half of it. Um, hence, double act. Um, we were on the comedy circuit in a, in a great time. Um, we were on the circuit with people like Joe Brand, who went on to fabulous fame and fortune. Uh, Eddie Izzard, who went on to fabulous fame and fortune. Julian Clary, who, you get the gist? We didn't. Um, we were two big girls with really awful hair, terrible dress sense, and we sang amusing songs of our own writing. And somehow we managed to actually do that for a living for five years. Well, I say a living, I didn't have a part-time real job in a shop when doing the comedy, otherwise I'd never have been able to afford to pay the rent and keep myself in pot noodle. Um, over those five years, although we didn't exactly hit the big time, we did okay. And even got to do a bit of TV work. Do you remember going live? Again, I don't know how old you all are, but please, somebody must be over 40 or 50 even. Uh, going live was a three hour children's show on a Saturday morning. Philip Schofield and Sarah Green hosted it. And it was hugely popular among the children it was meant for and a huge amount of hungover students. Um, well, we got the opportunity to audition for Going Live, to appear on the show on a regular basis, because they were looking for a comedy double act to appear every week. Well, for those of you that remember the show, you might remember Trevor and Simon. They got the job, not us. But we did get down to the final two, us and them. But it wasn't to be. However, it was when we were doing auditions for the show that I learned a very important lesson, which actually came in handy in a later career path. You see, Pet Talk were used to performing live on stage where everything was a bit over-exaggerated and larger than life. Um, and I didn't know, we both didn't know, that actually when you're being filmed for telly, you need to make everything a little bit more subtle and smaller. And so in our first filmed audition, we were jumping around and gesticulating wildly. And as I mentioned, we were quite big girls. One of the producers had to take us aside and she said, girls, have you ever thought about sports bras? We kind of looked down as if, do we look like we've ever thought about sport? She said, it's just your breasts. They're quite distracting. I rather like that. I thought I might use that for my epitaph. Rachel Agnew, her breasts were distracting. Anyway, as you know, because you haven't heard of us and Pep Talk is not exactly a household name, um, we didn't continue. And I ended up getting what my mother liked to call a proper job. And that's when I joined the music industry in marketing, which is what I'd actually trained for as an arts administrator at Leicester beforehand. I spent five years at Yamaha, that's the musical instrument side, not the motorbikes. I would never have been able to carry off the leather. Um, and I was mainly marketing and promoting concert grand pianos and working with artists, trying to convince them to play our pianos and not anybody else's. It was a great job. And other than really kickstarting my love for marketing and promotion, um, it was actually there that I met um, the man who was to become and then not become 10 years later, my husband. Anyway, that's an aside. After that, I worked for a classical music agent for a little while and then moved on to my big job, BMG Records, uh, which was one of the major record companies. Um, and I stayed there for 11 years. And one of the things that I loved about going to BMG was going to the same building every single day for 11 years, other than high days and holy days, obviously. Um, you see, at that time, I really hated change. I was a routine freak. Uh, routine was my middle name. Actually, I don't have a middle name, something I've berated my parents for for years. Um, but I suppose that really was a key reason why I loved the job, because I loved the knowledge of the same thing the same day. Uh, the other reason, of course, was that I loved the actual job I was doing. I had various roles in the company, but my last was my absolute ideal. 
I looked after what we like to call the music for old gits department. And I looked after the marketing of albums from big US acts like Barbara Streisand, Tony Bennett, Bette Midler, Barry Manilow, yes, all the hip and cool ones, ladies. Um, and also some UK acts like Rick Astley, Lisa Stansfield, and Chico. Do you remember Chico from The X Factor? Yes, I am partially responsible for getting Chico to the number one spot with It's Chico Time. And for that, I profusely apologise. Um, so although my job was quite diverse for the range of artists that I was working with, um, I had the security of working for a, a multinational company and, and all that that gives. And I honestly think that I would have stayed working there and would still be there now had they not forced my hand. I genuinely don't think I would have ever jumped ship. But then 2008 came and as we were sliding despondently into recession, I was made redundant. And that change that I feared was thrust upon me. I was gutted, absolutely gutted. And not just because I loved the job, I was really scared because of this fear of change. I was scared about doing something new and, and changing my life. And because it was 2008 and we were in this recession, there were no other jobs to be had. Now, luckily, I had a nice redundancy check so I could relax for a little while. And when I started to realise that there were just no full time jobs to be had or to even to apply to, um, I started getting little bits of offers of some freelance work from some contacts or, or old colleagues, just odd days here and there. And I suddenly thought, well, this is interesting. I've never thought of this for me because it didn't fit within me as a person. And along came then a proper project that needed a, a kind of commitment as a freelancer for a couple of days a week. And I had to make that decision. Do I commit to this, which I wouldn't, and it was somebody that I'd known for years, I wouldn't have wanted to let down and to take myself out of the full-time job market and give it a go. And as there was frankly no option, I went with it and I was really scared. But slowly I realized that as a single mum, my daughter was seven at the time, working from home a lot of the time was fantastically flexible. And not only for the school runs, obviously, but more importantly, you could multitask by not only working, but putting the washing on at the same time. So slowly my fear of change started to wane. And I realized that in this new world, kind of exciting things could happen whenever you least expected them to. And every day you could bring something new in the work environment. And that's how, by accident and by force of change, my portfolio career started. Portfolio career is an interesting word. I genuinely just say, I'll do anything anyone wants to pay me for, as long as it's legal, of course. So I started doing sort of small bits of marketing for a small range of clients, albeit predominantly in music and the arts, because that's sort of who I knew. And I started seeing opportunities where I'd never looked before. And I realized that the important thing was to jump feet first into anything that came my way, as I wasn't tied down to one main job. And it was that new mindset that allowed me to unleash my show off self again. You see, in 2009, so a year after redundancy, I entered and won the competition to become a loose woman. I'm hoping that most of you have even heard of loose women. Uh, for those that don't know, because you have a life, a job, a career, and all of that sort of thing, um, it's a lunchtime magazine programme on ITV. Four women sit around talking about, well, the news, topical issues, celebrities, men, um, it kind of reminded me of me and my friends sitting around, really. Um, but the point is, if I'd not been made redundant, then clearly I wouldn't have been sitting at home that lunchtime watching it. And if I hadn't had that change of mindset to be open to opportunities and to look for opportunities, I absolutely wouldn't have entered. So the competition was called Make Me a Loose Woman. And they asked me to send in a one minute video of why you thought you would make a good one. I started my video with the following line. I remember this is 11 years ago. <clears throat> Hello, 
I'm Rachel Agnew. I'm a 43-year-old Jewish Welsh asthmatic single mother and uh, oh, obviously I've buggered it up there. I'll try that one again. Hello, I'm Rachel Agnew. I'm a 43-year-old Jewish Welsh asthmatic, opinionated, self-employed, overweight single mother. What's not to like? I got there that time. And the lines seem to work. And well, to cut a long story short, and the long version is available for another talk uh, entitled How Loose Women Changed My Life, please contact my agent for bookings, uh, I won the competition. So the prize was to appear as one of the loose women for five programmes. But when it came to the last one, the producer took me aside and said they'd like to invite me back as a proper bona fide, i.e. paid presenter. This was unbelievable. In the space of a few months, I'd gone from really not knowing how I was going to earn a living to being offered work as a TV presenter on, on a very popular ITV show. And so I could then officially call myself a loose woman. Coincidentally, friends of mine have been calling me that for years. It was all quite an extraordinary experience, appearing on live telly, meeting and interviewing lots of celebrities. Oh, and I appeared in some press. Uh, there were some news pieces and amongst others, uh, The Mirror, The Express, oh, and Bella magazine. Um, I was a crossword clue in the Daily Mail. I thought I've hit the big time here. Three across, who recently won Loose Women competition? Rachel Agnew. I've got a copy in my desk here. <laughs> oh, and uh, I was a page three girl. I was. It was the Jewish Chronicle and from the neck up, but you've got to start somewhere. So my time on that programme led on to some other broadcast work on TV and radio, and I started doing after dinner speaking gigs. I tell you, I have schlepped the length and breadth of this country telling my how loose women change my life story. Not life story, life story. And of course, being on the telly and standing up in front of an audience at the speaking gigs really fulfilled my show off aspirations again. The speaking gigs included quite a lot of ladies luncheon clubs and women's institutes where the average age was about 93. And these lovely older ladies seemed to enjoy my talk a lot, although there always seemed to be one poor soul who fell asleep during it. Um, I like to put that down to the, the heavy lunch and the glass of wine rather than the boredom of my talk. Now, there was one occasion when a lady very much on the older edge of the age range actually took so ill that the paramedics had to enter the room while I was still talking. <laughs> can kind of put you off your stroke, I can tell you. Uh, she was fine in the end, thank goodness. And during the talk that I gave then, I also talked about my marriage breaking down and how I managed to get through that and recover from that, uh, which was uh, mainly through the help of a fabulous therapist, um, a wonderful network of family and friends, oh, and uh, my very, very good friend, Pino Grigio. What was interesting was that I spoke how, once I was at the other side of my divorce, so to speak, how life became so much better and that I had become, and still really am to this day, really good friends with my ex. And we would never have retained that friendship and love had we stayed together. Uh, one old lady came up to me after the speech one day, uh, having talked about all of that. She was terribly proper, twin set in pearls, octogenarian, kind of Margaret Thatcher, big hair, sort of looky-likey. Um, she told me that she'd wish she'd heard my talk years ago. Why, said I. She said, because I had to wait till the bastard died before I could get rid of him. Anyway, <laughs> on the back of the TV work, I also became a columnist in my local paper, the Ealing Gazette. It's not exactly the Financial Times, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. I wrote fortnightly columns, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, it was kind of middle aged ramblings, really, about anything I fancied chatting about. I know the receptionist at my dentist was an avid reader. Possibly she was the only one. Uh, but writing regularly was great. And it was there that I really honed my somewhat casual style of writing. And I realised how much I loved the written world, word, world, the written word. So while all this 15 minutes of 
fame, and I use it with a very small F, I think I might have got slightly higher than Z list, maybe X at a push. So while all of this was going on, I continued with my marketing work, of course. And writing had become a much more prominent part of that as well. I'd always written as part of my music industry work, press releases, biographies, marketing collateral, etc. But as time moved on and all these changes had been thrust upon my working life, I came to realize that all these skills, including writing, were completely cross transferable into other industries. And so I managed through referrals to start doing some marketing and copywriting for companies in other industries, not just in music and the arts. And then a few years ago, as my burgeoning broadcasting career, well, stopped burgeoning, um, I concentrated more and more on the marketing and copywriting and less and less on being a show off. Don't worry though, I'm sure she'll find her way back out there one day. I was back working in the music industry as a marketing consultant for a fantastic touring agent and management company, which I love. I'd also work for a DVD producer, I was an outsourced marketing director for a local school, and I had a retainer job running the marketing department of a national photographic brand. But I started to develop this client base even further. And that led to me joining my first ever networking group a year and a half ago. Now, the only networking I'd ever heard of was BNI, which I'm sure some of you might have been to. It meets at stupid o'clock in the morning, and I think you have to wear shoulder pads to be allowed in. That, that includes the men. It wasn't for me, from what I'd heard of it. I have to say I've never experienced it, so I'm making a complete <laughs> assumption from what I've heard. But meeting for breakfast in central London at 6.30 in the morning was never going to work for me. So I joined WIBM, Women in Business Networking, and immediately I loved it. Meeting like-minded women to talk about business and life over lunch in a lovely pub was perfect for me. I've made friends, got some great work from it, and got an extraordinary amount of support from the ladies in my group. There is such camaraderie because we all understand the difficulties of working for ourselves or running a small business, as well as juggling home life expectations. And the thing is, which I'm sure you'll all know, you have to use networking properly. I don't expect work just to come flooding in because you're there. You have to look at it as a long game. You develop the relationships, gain trust, and then people will hopefully start recommending you or using you themselves. It is amazing, and I'm sorry to say this, but I do think it's different in a women's only group. Guards are firmly down, and I think the support is even stronger. So my marketing consultancy is developing and growing and I pride myself on making it all very simple. There are many marketeers out there who like to make people think that marketing is some kind of dark art or witchery. It really isn't. It's a very easy concept. Who is your target market? What is the best way for you to reach them? And how do you communicate your message to them? That's it. It certainly isn't rocket science. Unless, of course, your client is a rocket scientist that wants some marketing help. The thing is, when we start a business, it's very easy to think as, that as we know all about our product or service, that we're the best person to write copy or design the website or print a collateral. But often our passion for the business can make our viewpoint very subjective. I mean, in all areas of life, we call upon an expert for something we can't do ourselves, right? Dentist accountant, photographer, plumber. I mean, I can bleed a radiator, but I wouldn't want to install my new boiler. Most of these things we can do a little of ourselves, but if we want it done professionally, to the highest quality, and to a level that is appropriate for our business, then we need to call in a professional. And the most important thing a marketeer can bring, other than experience and knowledge, is objectivity which is sometimes really difficult to apply when you're passionate about what you do. There's no doubt when we start our business, we try and understand our potential customer base. Is it B2B or B2C? Who are our potential customers? What's their demographic? How can we reach them? Well, hopefully we do that at the beginning, although I think there are probably some people that don't. Oftentimes we're so caught up with the production of the product or the service that we're offering 
that we forget that as our business grows, that our marketing has to grow with it. What once worked doesn't always work and continue that way. That's why marketing materials, printed collateral, website, social, paid advertising, etc., needs to be continually assessed. Is this activity really giving you a good return on your investment? Have you actually changed the focus of your business but not bothered to update your website? I come across these all the time. And a really embarrassing example is my own website, which until lockdown still was completely concentrating on the speaking gigs and broadcast work that I was doing and only a small amount was on marketing. It was eight years out of date. So I was sitting there telling clients, you've got to make sure your, your, your website has moved with the times and moved with your business. And I hadn't done it to myself. You know the expression, do as I say, not as I do. Then we have social media. Nowadays, business owners understand that social media is a, a massive way of getting our messages out to potential customers. But we have to be clever. We have to understand what consumers use, what social channels and how those channels work. Each channel has a completely different role to play dependent on your business or who you want to sell to. It's not just a case of posting some content, assuming people will see it. And it's the same with websites, of course. Just having a website doesn't mean people are going to find it. The site needs to be created properly if it's really going to be your shop window, which of course is what it is. And think about it from a, from a physical shop perspective. There's no point in building your shop, cramming it full of products and services, but then you realize you've built it in the middle of nowhere with no road running past it, no signposting to it, and no potential for anyone to know it's actually there. It's the same with websites. If it's not built properly, designed effectively and properly coded and optimized, no one will find it. Marketing in the digital age is massively important for all of us. But going back to what I said before, before we can't all be experts. So we must engage with professionals to help us make sure that we're doing it right. A web designer, a copywriter, an SEO person, a social media expert. So you know you're doing the best job to make your business work. And as I said, it's key that this is ongoing. I often use the expression that marketing is for life, not just for Christmas. It's not just about the beginning. It has to evolve. And it has to evolve because we evolve and our businesses change, sometimes of our own doing, and sometimes because it's been thrust upon us. And of course, there can't be one person that hasn't had change thrust upon them this year because of COVID. For me, when lockdown arrived, all my industry, music industry projects fell off a cliff because obviously there's no live gigs going on. The retainer contract that I had with a photography company was ended and all I was left with were a few small clients, all of whom weren't sure whether to keep up their marketing or website projects. Lockdown, of course, will have hit everybody over here and every one of us in different ways, some more personal, some more professional. As all my work dried up, I decided I had to be proactive. And I hope you all did too, whether you remained employed, were furloughed or are self-employed. The first thing I did was to create my new website, all singing, all dancing, very shiny new one that I'm very happy with. And then I started Uber networking. All the neat networking meetings had moved to Zoom. And I knew that because of what was going on, I needed to broaden my client base as much as possible. So I needed to develop the business, create new contacts and hopefully gain new clients while I had the time to do it. I joined a second networking group called Screen Pop, which is excellent, which actually is going to stay on Zoom, even when we're all allowed back meeting people again. And I've worked through the two networking groups really hard at trying to develop and expand this client base. And I'm really lucky that through an extraordinary amount of networking meetings and one-to-ones, I've already got some new work through this new group and developed some work through my old networking group. And the scope of work that I'm doing now has, has broadened even more. I've written copy and managed a new website project for an accountant. I've written for a medical aesthetics provider, Botox and all of that. Um, a kickboxing personal trainer, um, and even, this is brilliant, this is what I was working on last week, a Turkish marine engineering and vessel transportation company. 
I literally had no idea what I was writing about, but they seemed happy. Glamorous, huh? Of course, pre-lockdown, this variety of work was also complemented by speaking gigs and recording voiceovers for a, a couple of clients. And when music gigs were allowed, I was also marketing the tours of the likes of Lulu, Elaine Page and John Barrowman. Can't wait for the music industry to open up again, as you can imagine, not least because there's a 52 date Jason Donovan tour with my name written all over it. So now the person who loved routine and hated change thrives on this portfolio career. The music industry marketing, as I say, is slowly coming back and planning for next year. And I'm actually doing a little bit of work right now on some um, outdoor gigs, socially distanced, of course, outdoor gigs at Camden Market. But I also have this fantastically broad range of small businesses and entrepreneurial clients as a marketeer and a copywriter. I've got the speaking gigs. I still appear on the Jeremy Vine show on Radio 2 from time to time. And I do the odd bit of voiceover work and don't tell anyone, but I've got an exciting writing project in the pipeline. So to finish, my advice to all of you is don't pigeonhole yourself. Allow yourself to diversify. And even if it's something you've never thought about before, contemplate self-employment. Of course, there are some worrying times and there are times when you wish to God that PAYE was still part of your life. But having a broad variety of work, being adaptable and flexible and loving working from home has made me at long last someone who thrives on change. And it's the best thing I've ever done. Thank you. Wow, Rachel, that was just amazing. <laughs> uh, um, I, well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. I think to me, what you've actually managed to achieve from over such a varied time, keep reinventing yourself has been absolutely incredible and, and is great for us all just to think about how we might do that. Clearly, there must have been some, some really difficult times. Yeah, for sure. How, what, what, what did you manage to do in those difficult times? What sort of got you through them? Um, other than my friend, Pino Grigio. Um, <laughs> genuinely, I think... I've, I've always been a kind of a half full person. So I think positivity is essential. When things, a bit like I said about what I've done during the COVID crisis is, you know, I could have sat there and I know quite a lot of people that had sat there who were furloughed or self-employed and sat going, oh God, why me, why me? Well, actually that's pointless because it's happening to everyone across the world. Um, you have to work out what you can do to get more work. It's being in touch, you have to be quite belligerent, you have to be quite pushy, getting pe into people's minds when you're self-employed so that they remember that you're there because people get on with their world and maybe you're not in the first point of thought when they may be talking to another client or someone else. Those recommendations only come through if you're being thought about. So you have to push yourself um, and just keep positive. It's the only thing you can do or you sink. Thank you. I'm just just sticking with furlough and lockdown. Um, one of the questions that we have come in is that obviously lockdown has been a huge challenge for, for lots of people. And you're obviously a very positive, versatile individual. Have there been any positive changes that have come out of it for you or things that you're going to try and continue or you would recommend that any of us try and continue? Um. I think the positive things that have come out for me have been personal things. It's about realizing who's important in your life. I think we've all kind of started to question everything. And therefore I started to question the people that I surround myself with. And it kind of goes back to that last point, which is negativity is really horrible. And I can't, I, I, so I've got some friends that maybe, uh, I might not see so much anymore because I haven't liked the way that they have approached the whole COVID issue, i.e. making it all about them, which it isn't. It's about everybody and the world. I've also realized, you realize, I think, who your real friends are, the people that put themselves out for you, um, you know, and I think from a business perspective, it 
it's that same thing which is understanding your clients who maybe you've even let you go that they are really struggling so keeping in touch with people keeping in touch with your clients and making them realize that you're human and that you think about them and you care about them and it's not just about fat have you got any got jobs for me it, it's it's making sure that you have those personal conversations with clients that make them realize that you're a decent chap and that you're not just thinking about yourself in all of this. I think that's probably the, the key thing um, from a business perspective, you know, trying to keep engaging and making sure people know that you care about them and what they're going through. We've then got a, a couple of questions about networking groups. So I'll yep. take those together. First is just asking to remind us that the two networking groups that you mentioned Okay, the first one, so I've been a member for about a year and a half, is WIBN, Women in Business Networking. Uh, they're across the country, as far as I'm aware. It's fantastic. I'm a member of the Chiswick group because that's the, the closest one to me. We've got only 10 members, but we have visitors and stuff. And we usually meet once a month for lunch in a nice pub. Um, and it is just brilliant. Um, we're on Zoom meetings. We had a Zoom meeting yesterday and we had some visitors there. And it just... It is this, I, and I genuinely believe that women networking with women just has a different flavor and feel to it. Yeah. The new group is called Screen Pop. It's actually, it started um, uh, as lockdown started, the women that run it very cleverly, they had a, a physical group in Essex, Hertfordshire, East London. And they realized that as they were moving on to Zoom, that actually it wouldn't be a bad thing to maybe start something that will continue on Zoom throughout. So I've actually joined the North Essex group, even though I live in Ealing, because geography doesn't matter, um, particularly for the work that I do. There would be some industries where it very much would. Um, but they're growing. I think they've got some in the Midlands now and in North Wales, I think. But they literally have grown exponentially during the last three, four months. So Screen Pop and WIBN. Great. And we have a lady on who is responsible for the wow, I like that, women of work for uh, Orthodox Jewish businesswomen. Oh, and she okay. Wants to know how can she encourage each of them, well, them and each other to refer work to one another? Gosh, I mean, I suppose it's about that thing that I think I said about getting to know each other. I was quite lucky when I joined WIBN that I got work quite quickly. Um, but because of what I do, it can be quite useful to a lot of different people and, and a broad range of industries. You know, in our group, we've got an interior designer. I'm not sure she's got anything, but she's starting to get people a year on knowing her. I know her well enough, even though I haven't worked with her, that if someone said to me, do you happen to know an interior designer? I would recommend her. So it is about, I think, if you're running that group, making sure that people know when they join what the point is. It's not just a social thing. Networking is about business. The social bit is a fantastic add-on, um, but, but it's about making sure that your communications and your marketing, she says, can't help myself, is very clear that the, the end game of this is for everyone to support each other's business rather than just a nice social thing for people to sit around and chat. So it should come naturally. I think it, it certainly does in the groups that I'm in, there's a natural way that you think about the people that you've got to know. And if somebody says to me, oh, do you know a mortgage advisor or a financial advisor? You know, I know who I would go to first. I would hope that within your group that should start to happen. I don't know how new or old it is, but I would hope to think that it, it would kind of start to happen organically. I hate that word. It's a bit overused, but actually it should just happen if the messaging is right, that it is very much a business networking, not just a social networking. Thank you. That helps. you. You seem to be incredibly confident and courageous. Um, you know, hearing you know how your work life, how your professional career has changed over the past few years. Do you? Th a couple of questions on that point. Firstly, do you think that your experience as a stand-up comedian has influenced your personal approach um, to business, and do you think that has given you more confidence? And then tips on confidence really we have a question here from a lady who is acknowledging that her confidence has been knocked by a current employer um, um although after ending a marriage after 32 years she's much much happier as a result of that but 
um, there's a comfort zone at work with salary, et cetera, et cetera. How do you get the confidence to start networking yourself while you're still employed, but with a view to a much more independent future? You know, would you have any tips or advice in that regard? Okay, I'll, I'll do that one first. Uh, well, no, I'll go the other one first. The, the, it's a sort of chicken and egg, isn't it? So I've just put my fan on. I hope that's not too noisy, but I'm, I'm starting to melt slightly. Is that all right? Good. Um, uh, Stand-up comedian, did that influence or the other way around? So, yeah, I'm naturally confident. I was always naturally... My father used to call me his daughter with the sunny disposition, which is very, when I was a kid. So I have always been just, I, I am an inherently annoyingly positive person and, um, and a show off. I mean, genuinely, you know, I used to put on plays for the babysitter. Um, so the stand up comedy was a sort of obvious thing to go into. Um, it's an awful career and I wouldn't recommend it, to be honest. Um, it's pretty brutal. But yes, of course, it's sort of, it influences the way I deal with life. Humour has always, even in our family, has been a way of dealing with stuff, tragedies, awful stuff. There's always a humor, humorous element to it. And it, in work, it's the same. It, it does influence, I suppose, the people I work with, um, the people I want to spend time with, because I am never going to be a really serious person. I'm not going to be. There are many marketing consultants out there who will spend hours telling you, you know, the, the, the kind of studies, the science behind it all. I don't, I, that's why I say I try to make it simple because I don't think it needs to be anything but that. Um, sorry, I'm turning that off. It's annoying me now. Um, so, so it does have an influence because there's a confidence in me to do this, to, to chat, to stand up in front of people in a room that I suppose makes me... Uh, very comfortable talking to new people, very comfortable walking into a room of strangers, which I've never had an issue with. Um, moving on to the other lady, you know, I, I'm sorry that your marriage broke down, but I'm really happy that you're happier because that was what happened to me. You know, I mean, we haven't been together for as long as that, um, only 10 years. Um, and again, I wouldn't have left that marriage. I would still be married to him and really unhappy. He sort of had to make that jump which is why kind of it took a while, but then I realized he was right. Once I realized he was right, that's how I then kind of came out the other side, if that makes sense. So I think it is slowly, slowly, if you've been in a long-term relationship with someone and you're in a long-term job, you've got to find your time for yourself. It's really key and it's, it's slightly hackney to say it, but you are the most important person and you have to find if you have a thought about maybe breaking out going off on your own you have to find the time within your current work social space to potentially network to potentially get out there dating again honestly it's hilarious that's a whole different subject for another talk oh the stories I can tell you about middle-aged dating brilliant and horrible and fun and very funny um stories to tell um, so I, mm, I, I'm not sure I can give much more on that, but it's about searching deep and finding the real you, the person that maybe you haven't been, that, that needs to come back again. Mm. I'm not sure that that was particularly helpful. I'm sorry if it wasn't. <laughs> Another question we've got for you is whether you have a daily routine or you would recommend a daily routine when you've got perhaps a bit less structure than being in a corporate world. How do you stay motivated? How do you get things done? Set the alarm is, <laughs> is the biggest thing. I mean, genuinely, you know, I know people that, you know, when, even when they haven't got anything to do, you know, they, they, or even when they have got something to do, they just wait, they come to their desk in their pajamas or whatever. Absolutely not. Even during COVID, I set the alarm every day, Monday to Friday to get up. Now, part of that's because I take the dog for a walk and I always meet my, my dog walking friends, but actually I could easily have not done that. It's always been really key to me that I set the alarm, I get up, I get clean, um, I put clothes on. Now, I might not have jewellery on and I won't have makeup on, but I'll have sort of done my hair and I will go to work. Now, going to work, it's a fabulous commute. It's about four seconds from down that corridor. <laughs> you know, it's, it's great. But that's the, that's the key thing to start the day properly and then it will run. Otherwise... It's like in any job where you've got lots of things to do. You have an ongoing to-do list. You go, which one do I want to do best? Because it's the easiest one. I'll start with that. You know, should I put off that one because it's difficult? Yes, it's like anything. 
the key thing that you have to be able to do in this kind of environment particularly is be able to quickly change between thought processes so you know i know a lot of people and i i, I sound really i'm going to generalize here but i think men are just not though very good at it but i can very easily quickly flip from talking to someone about jason donovan to the turkish marine vessel engineering company to somebody ringing up and saying oh god can you do a quick voiceover for me etc except to oh actually let's give all this up and put the washing on and, and fit in the garden it, you kind of need to be able to have that mindset where you can switch because actually it is a different mindset for all the different things i do and if you're someone and i'm quite jealous of people like this that are so engrossed in something that they can't be distracted from it I'll be distracted if a piece of dust flies over there. You know, I'm very, very easily distracted. If you're somebody that can't be distracted easily, it might be tough for you. Um, you need to be able to stop, do something else, come back to it. That kind of mindset in work is kind of essential if you want to do lots of different things. Just, just following on from that point about doing lots of different things, you obviously work in by virtue of your portfolio career in many sectors wildly different work areas but you're you so how do you maintain the one of our questions is how you maintain the rachel agnew brand across that sphere of sectors and work areas um but do you know what i think it goes to people by people so it's it is me when I did my website um, in March and I looked at it and thought this is ridiculous it was so appallingly out of date and I you know I was really embarrassed that you know it was even there on, on the internet um, and my sister's a web designer so she was doing the design we'd agreed all of this I had to obviously write the copy what with being a copywriter and everything and I struggled I struggled harder than any client that I've dealt with in recent times to actually write the copy about myself and what I realized it was, was because I was trying to not be me. I was trying to be a grown up marketing consultant. <laughs> I looked at other people's websites and they were talking about this and this, you know, all this kind of really heavy duty stuff. And I kept thinking, why is this just not fitting for me? And then I was sort of doing that metaphorical thing of, you know, when you used to type on a typewriter, you pull the paper out, scrunch it up and throw it over your shoulder. I was metaphorically doing that daily for about three or four days because I couldn't get it. And then I realized what it was, was that I was, I was not trying to be me. I was trying to be somebody else. So the thing that covers the whole of it, all of that I do is me, who is not overly serious, though very serious about the business of the business that I do. But if you, I'm not telling everyone they have to look at it, but if you look at my website, rachelhagnew.co.uk, you'll <laughs> see it's kind of got my sense of humor. It's, it's short, it's succinct, it's simple. It just says, this is what I do. If you're interested, get in touch and we'll have a chat. Rather than over, so, so I think if that answers the question, it's my personality because I really, really believe that people buy people. Um, if you like someone, you want to work with them. If you don't like someone, you kind of go, oh, well, if I'll take the money if I have to, but you know, you're not necessarily going to recommend them. You're not going to, you know, it depends how desperate you are at that point <laughs> as to whether you take the job or not. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your work-life balance and that's an interest to quite a few people on the webinar because working from home can sometimes make it more difficult because you don't have a, a commute so you don't have a shut-off time and then a delineation of when, when it's work and when it's home because as you say your commute is four seconds. Yeah. So how do you make sure that you get a good work-life balance or don't you? <laughs> uh, no, I do genuinely. Um, but again, and it goes back to what I said earlier, it's because I've always been very good at cutting off at stopping when needed. The joy of working from home is that if I decide this afternoon, actually, do you know what? It's quite nice weather. Look at my to-do list. I'm going to go and sit in the garden for an hour. It won't, it's going to be thundering later. But anyway, let's just say, or I want to meet someone for a coffee, or actually it's quite quiet. I need to go and do, go to the shops. I can do that because this evening, there is nothing stopping me doing the work that I could have done this afternoon, assuming that it's sort of work I can just do on my own. Um, but actually, I think my work-life balance is better for being at home 
because of the things that you can do while you're here. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but I remember, particularly when my daughter was young, I was a single mum. I'd pick her up from the childminder on the way home from work. You know, I'd come in, I'd think, oh God, I need to do washing. I need to do this. I need to do some cooking. All of that. And then you'd never sit down of an evening. There is so much that you can do while at home and just, oh, 10 minutes. Do you know what? Where And so many people, and, and you, I can imagine all of you on this call that have been working from home during this, this period will realise that actually that old adage of, oh, people don't really work at home. No, you work harder because you're not sitting. I used to, when I had a proper job, I used to go and make a coffee. I'd be gone for an hour just to go to the kitchen to make a coffee because I bump into this one or bump into that one. You talk about last night's Coronation Street and then you talk about you know, work that you, oh, I'm, doing with, I'm dealing with this one or that one. I think there are so many lost hours in an office environment. I mean, I miss an office. I love the social aspect of an office, 100%. But there are so many wasted hours. I can do more work between maybe 10 and 5 here. I rarely stop for lunch. You know, if I do, it's 10 minutes. If my daughter's around, we might have half an hour together. Um, the other thing that really helps me now is I've got a dog last year who has remained remarkably silent through this whole morning as a sleep <laughs> by the chair. So thank you, Watson. Um, but that has been brilliant because I have to walk him in the afternoon and at some point. So at some point, I just go, right, I'm stopping for an hour. And it, that gives me that old commuting space. It gives me, and I was using it to make phone calls at the beginning. I was using that dog walking time at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, I'll ring so-and-so. And then someone told me off actually really sensibly and said, use that time to look at Ealing Common, to, to think, to be a bit mindful rather than mindful with a double L. You know, just think about nothing or something, but don't, but enjoy it. Enjoy the senses. So Honestly, I literally, the thought of going back to an office job now, though I did love the social thing, I couldn't bear it now. It works for me. It, it, and I genuinely believe it doesn't work for everybody. I think there are people that, you know, would be too distracted, would end up in their nighty till three o'clock in the afternoon. But that's just dangerous. A really slippery slope. I think we've, we've probably got time to squeeze one more um, question in. I think this is a question which I would personally be really interested to hear the answer to. Ed, go on. What is your, the next challenge for Rachel Agnew? Ooh. What are you going to do next or hoping to achieve next and how are you going to do it? Um, I want to keep building the business. I, I really love this development of, of what I realised that I was slightly concentrating on two clients that gave me lots and lots of work and that's dangerous and one of them went in covid so that's that's silly so i need to spread myself i need to spread the risk um so i really want to continue developing everything that i'm doing in the business my show-off self is starting to itch to come out a little bit more so i'm kind of i'm kind of hoping that there's a new speaking sort of speech i don't know i need to work on my new my new story my new, and maybe it's this maybe it's maybe it's talking more about business which it never was it was all about sort of my life and and personal stuff um but i did mention i've got a writing project it is really early 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 stages um but i think there's a book in most of us and um there's a book that i'm really very I've got a pad over there. It's got about three pages of notes. That's it. But I'm quite excited about it. Um, and that needs to be fitted in amongst everything else. So I'm currently kind of researching ideas on characters and, ha and how you properly put a story together. Because it's something I've never done. But I love writing and it would be daft kind of not to try it. And it is loosely based on reality, let's say. A story that may have a middle-aged redhead really <laughs> fake um, with a dog because there's dogs involved in it that sounds awful anyway <laughs> that's what I'll say um, so you know uh, that, that I think is the sort of most exciting thing on the, in the pipeline though it's so early days it, it might not see fruition for two years who knows um, but actually actually sorry I'm just going to say and also in answer to that I don't know and that's the point 
because all these big things that have happened to me have just, you know, the phone rings and you go, oh my God, who knew that was going to happen? And that's the excitement. That's what I never know what's going to happen. And I really love that. So it's about keeping my eyes open and jumping into those opportunities. There we go. I think that's it really. Well, thank you, Rachel. That has been so well, so interesting, so humorous. I love your humor. And I think that's really helped Thanks. to get you through weight. I think it helps us all get through what we need to do in life. So having a bit of humor and trying to um, not take ourselves too seriously is really good. Clearly you've done that in spades. <laughs> really inspiring because I think, you know, the, when everybody has anything, it's changing their life. It's so easy to sort of shrink back from it, but you've sort of given us all the courage to really go forward, jump in, I think you said, with both feet. Mm. just go for it and, and you know see where it leads and I think yeah. the networking part and so many people on the on this webinar today have, have been encouraged by it we've had quite a few people saying do you know what I'm going to get off my backside and do a bit more of that Good. that's brilliant um, I'd, lo I'd love that because honestly you just don't know what you're going to get out of it it's fantastic yeah so thank you from the we've, we've my really great pleasure thank it. you all. thank you for coming all of you who've come <laughs> <laughs> I'll do some work now <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody and look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>